It's the film of sex and drugs and rock and roll. It's more that kind of Armageddon, that kind of apocalyptic feel that happened in the end of the 60s. It was the new wave which represented what the youth of England and Western Europe was feeling at that time. Swinging 60s in London. Big social revolution going on here. Performance is a reflection of the 60s. In the 60s, you could get something together. We said, look, at, we're going to make this movie. It remains to this day one of the two or three most astonishing experiences in a cinema that I've ever had. The 60s are, has often been described as a time of sex and drugs and rock and roll, and it's true. People were experimenting with drugs for the first time. People using heroin, coke, marijuana, uppers, downers, LSD, you name it. You know, 60s was the sort of birth moment of that kind of culture. Uh, and that had a big influence, definitely. If you go back, there's a genre of Hollywood films they're called Swinging London Films, and they are terrible. This film does it, it's there. There's two girls and a guy in a bath talking about whether they should wash their hair. There's drugs being taken completely casually without any excitement or reference. This is a new world. And Performance is certainly the first British film uh, that showed us that world. And Jagger was the incarnation of all this. He was the person that they were warning their children against. And he was the person their children wanted to be like. And performance brought him onto the screen. He'd never been on the screen before. Nobody like that had ever been on the screen before. So you really do have a film which captures a large part of the 60s with the incredible resources of uh, Rogue's Eye and with Camel's mind. I've never seen that sort before. Well, Donald obviously had been very much part of the scene, the Chelsea scene in the 50s, and, and as an artist, etc. But then, at a certain point, he went to Paris and became disillusioned with the whole thing. He felt that, in a way, painting was um, passé. And he got drawn to movies. He felt that the future lay there. But he was no longer part of the swinging 60s in London scene. Uh, and he was in Paris, which had its own scene. The new way for Donald Camel was it. He was living in Paris. He had a sort of an atelier uh, studio come apartment in, on the left bank. And um, he was meeting those filmmakers and writers and actors and talking to them and was tremendously excited by their concepts and ideas. I met him through his girlfriend. She was a supermodel. She was a gorgeous um, Texan girl called Deborah. And we became friends. And then eventually Donald tried to pull me. And then when I met Brian Jones and uh, when I started to hang out with him, I kind of was his idol because that was his dream kind of type come true. You know, you want to be like half Mick Jagger, half Brian Jones. Donald had already been working on it. In other words, there was a treatment. We'd had quite an extensive treatment that probably was 25 or 30 pages long. I remember once we went to Central Pay for a weekend and he had this, this kind of pages of written stuff and they all fell in the water and so we had to all get them out and then iron them. <laughs> so I actually ironed the script of performance. The moment where performance takes off is the moment when Camel comes back to London from Paris and he locks himself into a flat with a guy called David Litvinoff. David Litvinoff was a fascinating character, and he got involved with the underworld, the gangster element, uh, the Cray brothers. Litvinoff really knew these people. I said, shut your bloody hole! He was moving in that world, the world between rock and roll and violence. <laughs> Performance is a film which is drawing on a vast reservoir of material. I was an agent, and amongst my clients was uh, Mick Jagger and the Stones. Mick wanted to work in films. I was representing Donald Camel. I was representing the Stones and discussing with Donald ideas for movies and the fact that we would 
believed in each other, we had some kind of connection. I thought, why not? Let's go for it. Right from the beginning, it was gangster meets pop star. Originally written for Marlon Brando and Mick Jagger. That was the original intention. This was going to be a vehicle for those two. They can't cast Brando. He's not going to play a cockney criminal. And they cast James Fox. On the one hand, obvious, James Fox was probably the biggest, young, leading actor in British cinema at that time. On the other hand, completely unobvious. Let's go. What do you mean, Harry Flares is waiting for you? Almost all the types he's played have been upper-class figures quite like himself. And then Litvinov, he's called a dialogue coach in the final credits of the film, but he sends him off to uh, South London. And Fox lives there for two or three months. And he comes back as Chaz. He's got the clothes, he's got the accent, and he's also got the violence. Come on, did I tell you? What did I tell you? Look at his chest <laughs> James immersed himself in this world of boxing, of small-time crime, of violence, etc., and he went far beyond anything I ever expected he would be able to do as an actor. He's a brilliant actor. Donald came up and asked me to be in a film because um, they had it all together. I mean, there was loads of talk of Mick, whether I should do it, I shouldn't do it. Keith would always say, how much are you going to get for this film? I'll give you the money, don't do the film. And he didn't understand that I wanted just to do something that I wanted to do. Michelle was an invention of Donald's, and he cast the young girl to fit his invention. I mean, it was not only his fantasy, but his reality, this menage a trois, and was part of his scene. So all of these contacts of Camel appear on the screen, and then to climax it, they have hired Johnny Shannon as a dialogue coach to teach James Fox how to speak with their voice. And then, in a really brilliant last-minute decision, they cast him as Harry Flowers, someone who's never acted before. Who do you think you are? The Lone Ranger? I know who I am, Harry. Of course you do, son. You're Jack the Lad. Obviously, Mick was established as a superstar, really, at that point, and that, in fact, would have been the great attraction when Sandy Leverson put together the deal with Warner Brothers. I told the people that I was working for, it was ICM by them, that I was going to become a producer. They tried to talk me out of it, but I said, no, I want to do it, and let's do it together. They put the deal together with Warner Brothers literally in 72 hours. Sandy had done the deal, and... Um, Donald had never directed a film before, Nick Rogue had never directed a film before, and Sandy Lieberson had never produced a film before. Nick Rogue, he was going to be the co-director. He would be responsible as part of his co-directing for the look of the film, the textures, the colors, how it was going to be lit, etc. But even that was a shared experience between Nick and Donald. They both brought their ideas to the visual side of it. But Nick was always a partner. He was always the co-director of the film. Nick, shall we say he was the technical director. I mean, he, he decided the setup and obviously the lighting because he was the DP as well. And Donald did the actual directing of actors. The two of them became a single focus on the story and the characters and what was being said. So it was an intimate relationship. They were on the set together, they were having dinner together, they were talking together, they were drinking together, smoking together, whatever. So it was an incredibly intense, personal, uh, and exciting relationship to see. At a certain point, um, it was Nick Rogue who actually invited me out to dinner and asked me if I would um, produce the film. I discussed it with Donald and Nick and I suggested that this um, particular subject and the way the film was scripted, we could shoot the whole thing on location. Having said that, of course, where do you find a great mansion house in the centre of London, which is actually empty? Loads of people now always go in London, oh, power is square, power is square. That's where you shot performance, isn't it? And, and it's not. I suddenly remember the crumbling mansion in Lown Square and we moved in and built some of the sets within the house as well. So, uh, in fact, the, the opening apartment in the, the garden sequence and the, the uh, kitchen sequences and uh, various other things were shot in there. That's actually a, a set that was built in the living room of the uh, 
the house and land square. And Poet Square is purely the, the exterior because the, the actual exterior of, um, of the land square wasn't as good as the Poet Square. I just entered the, the set with the bed scene. So that was the first scene that we did. And that, that took us seven days. That was absolutely marvellous because it was shot on a Bolex camera on 16mm on, on ectochrome and forced to develop several times. Nick put a big lamp right down on the bedclothes so the light that was actually coming and lighting them was filtered through blankets, which was really beautiful because they had this wonderful warm feel. So we shot one roll and I came up and I said to Nick, well, we better reload the camera. And Nick said, you have had enough fun, now I'm taking over. It was no much fun. But it looks like fun anyway, yeah. No. But I mean, even with Michelle, she was so insecure by then. I mean, the reality is like um, different. It's, um, it's the magic of film, isn't it? I think I would make a distinction between the first and the second and half of the film in terms of the acting. In the first half of the film, if you look at the script, the film is following the script actually very closely. You get into Power Square and things completely disintegrate. The original script has a huge plot line about a drugs bust. People come in and out of the house, there's a whole kind of business around it. All of that disappears in favour of Jagger, Pallenberg and Fox alone in the house. James Fox, the big hero of mine, there he was, you know, sitting at the table with a script from morning until evening, hardly saying a word, you know. I mean, we must have driven him quite crazy, really. Fox will tell you that was very close to what Pallenberg was doing to him all the time. You know, he was the straight guy uh, who she was mocking, guying, etc. But he did it perfectly without, you know, he's an actor, so he didn't really need to. How much did you give him? Two-thirds of the big one. Oh, that's insane. What's certain is there's an enormous number of reference to the most important contemporary literature, to Borges, to uh, Burroughs, uh, to Genet, to Artaud. Uh, Camel was a very, very well-read uh, figure, and the references wind in and out uh, all through the film. Well, there's a lot of things in the film. You know, if you look, you're going to find them. I mean, how many people know that this Borges, when, you know, that moment happens? One percent of the audience? But that's Donald, but again, that's the energy that's in the film, isn't it? They would not have allowed such things to happen to me in the sanitarium, he thought. And he felt two things. The first... Yes, I know why. Yeah? Yes. Ah! What is it? I mean, he was influenced tremendously by Borges, wasn't he? Where does a bullet go? goes right through him, doesn't it? The glass shatters into Borgay's head. I mean, that's where Donald wanted to be inside Borgay's head. Donald was in Borgay's head. You could take the film uh, and literally go through it for literature, for painting, for, you know, film, for, I mean, it's a huge repertoire of references for music. Robert Johnson is in there. You know, there's, this is a film which really is drawing on very wide, much wider than normal, uh, expanse of culture. You don't have to know Artaud's theories about madness to understand what Turner's saying. The only performance that makes it, that really makes it, that makes it all the way, is the one that achieves madness. Right? Am I right? You with me? I'm with you. It also gives us the soundtrack. It gives us the... Um, uh, the Jack Nietzsche music, it gives us the synthesizer, which didn't even exist in 69. My dad was always looking for new sounds or combinations, always working on chords. My father was proud of the score. I think it was the first time that he was sort of given free reign to experiment, and it really energized him. He got one of the first nine Moog synthesizers ever, and he got it specifically to work on performance. and. I do remember him bringing it to the house and setting it up, and it was like a, a kid in a toy shop, you know, and just playing around with all the sounds, and I was just blown away, because, you know, never heard anything like that in, in the 60s. Before that, we had to record some backing tracks. 
remember, you know, Mick sings in the film. Uh, and we had to have the back, some backing tracks to go with it. So even before Jack Nietzsche came on, we had to organize some recording to be done uh, for Mick's song. Shooting Mimo for Turner was wonderful fun. It was the first music video. It was my first film as a camera operator, uh, so it was very much in at the deep end. And uh, a lot of it quite tricky, actually. It was things like Mick had to spin around and smash the butt of a pistol into the mirror, and I had to zoom in on it, which was it was a once because the mirror was built, it was part of the building. It wasn't like now where you'd have six or seven repeats and you could do it over and over again. It was called First Take or Nothing. The excitement of filmmaking uh, uh, is the unexpected, you know, just that one element that you cannot absolutely predict. I had to reshoot a scene, and that was the one with the too much B12 doesn't hurt anybody, where, because by then I already had a habit, and I thought I was being very secretive about it. I didn't realize everybody knew. And so he made me do that scene, and it's B12, it's a vitamin. And then he gets a good shot of my bottom. <laughs> but there are those wonderful, absolutely unpredictable moments just in the performance. And then the scene where I go down in the elevator with blood on my whatever, and I probably hide Mick's body. And that's probably when they decided what the ending was gonna be. Hello, Chaz. It's quite clear that when they finished editing, after a long time, it was a long edit in London, uh, they had a film which Rogue, uh, Camel, uh, and Lieberson, the three key people, uh, decided was a film they wanted to release. We took a cut of the film to Los Angeles that we all felt was the cut of the movie that we wanted to present to Warner Brothers. And that was a disaster. <laughs> started screening the film, and maybe a halfway into it, the audience started to yell at the screen. This is the worst mother, you know, so-and-so. This is terrible. This is awful, <laughs> right? The cut of the film that we took to Los Angeles and previewed in Los Angeles was a great cinematic disaster. I mean, for, for that reason alone, it should go down in the history books, I think. Warner Brothers were horrified. They were horrified by the violence, but they were also horrified by the fact that Jagger didn't appear until so late in the film. You know, here was the one thing they were betting on. Donald wanted me to cut the, mo the movie so that this was in the way that it's, it now is, and I refused to do it. I said, Donald, this, it's confusing enough already for three minutes. If we do it for any longer, we're going to alienate the audience, and I won't do it. I won't do it. So away we went to recut the movie. And Nick said, sorry, but I've got to go off to Australia. I'm making walkabout, and uh, I'm not going to f around with Warner Brothers and go through all that crap. And I wasn't going to stay. I had a film to start immediately afterwards. I had to leave Donald there on his own, and so did Nick. But essentially, we had to leave the film there with him, trust him. So Camel goes off to LA and starts on another long edit which takes some of the violence out and brings Jagger closer to the front of the film. But it also gives us that very rapid editing without which the opening of the film is almost unthinkable now. The first part of that show was really slow, you know? But that, you know, the opening was just like, that was a lot of fun. I knew I'd have to kind of slide things back and forth or extend something to make it hit right on a note or on a frame. And I could do three or four or five of those cuts and it would just go bang. I mean, it was just perfect. It was like, you know, a beat, you know, and it was an abstract beat. And all the beats worked wherever they were. I understand now what was going on, but, you know, I keep saying poetry. There was a sense of poetry. There, you know, there was a sense of music and meter and visual meter. Because film is visual meter, I think, you know. How did we get into that madness? I mean, how did, how did it unfold? It just unfolded. It was there for us to discover. It's like going into a, you know, some kind of a diamond or gold mine or something, and there's the vein. They wanted Mick Jagger in earlier, so, you know, we tried to figure out what did we have that was footage we didn't use that we could use just to put him on the screen, you know? 
And uh, we found this film. He says, Donald says, well, there's this thing where he's kind of spraying up the side of the wall of his painting. You know? So I said, let's try it. You know, so we just put that in. <laughs> But there was Mick Jagger, you know, he came in earlier, which was kind of hilarious. But it worked because the film was working. You could do anything to that film, it would work, you know, because of the way it was happening. I mean, anything that felt right, it was going to work, you know, it was just all about feeling. You know, it was, it was poetry, you know, it was organic. It was coming from the spirit, and Donald and I connected on that level. And, and we pulled in, you know, that side of the, the ocean with what's happening in Hollywood. So two years later, the film was released. But in terms of where the film was going to open and how, that was all Warner Brothers' decision. I remember they sort of let it die out. They got scared. It was, it was shocking. Um, the reviews were not bad. Some of them were interesting, I thought. Some of the reviewers thought it was good, and some of them, of course, blasted it, you know. But there were some good reviews if you go back in that time. He didn't deliver the same film that we went to Los Angeles with but he delivered something very special, something, you know, unique. And that thing that is unique is a result of the collaboration between Nick Rogue and Donald Camel. We were, you know, kind of talking about the next film we were going to do, I mean, because we had such an incredible working relationship. And Donald was hot. You know, Demon Seed and Wild Side and performance. Donald was interested in making a lot of money. He just wanted to make movies, you know. And I remember the last time I saw him, this beautiful spirit came out, and he was just so gentle and, and so loving, you know, and so positive about we were going to make it work. It was like, we're going to do what we always wanted to do. Because, I mean, I had a relationship with him, what, for 20 years, you know? But I'd never seen Donald like this before. He didn't give up, you know? I just... I guess he just wanted to take it out his way, you know. And that was it. The end of the film. Uh, it's strictly undecidable what's happened. Is it a moment when the two of them merge into one? Uh, the film really doesn't tell you. There's no way you could say the film decides on that. Time for a change. It's time for a change. If a, a gangster had appeared in a retired pop star's um, crumbling mansion, um, one can see how things might have evolved like that. So it, it has a very similitude, I think. Um, what a dreadful question. What do I think of it? What's it all about? I don't know. Do you know what it's about? <laughs> you have to decide. You have to think. It's a film that really takes you through it and at the end says, you decide. We were using the times to, in a way, allow us to have an expression of these ideas, of looking at society, people, the establishment. I've seen loads of films from, from that period again, just to kind of see w how I felt about them. And they all have got like a time kind of warp. And performance is completely timeless and it's extraordinary. And every time you discover something new and it's almost kind of uh, transcendental, really. And that's probably what makes it a kind of such a great film. This film crystallized a lot of things that happened in the 60s. It's the film which really suggested that there was a kind of utopian other world there. And it's also the best British gangster film that's ever been made. And it's the juxtaposition of those two films that make it such an extraordinary classic.